Welcome back. With less than 50 days to go before the elections in the U.S., we're talking American politics with former Senator Mike Gravel, who ran for president on the Democratic and Libertarian tickets before quitting electoral politics earlier this year. He recently co-authored a candid portrait of his life entitled A Political Odyssey, The Rise of American Militarism and One Man's Fight to Stop It. In it, he discusses U.S. foreign policy, the power of the president and corporate America. And we were touching on some of these issues before the break, sir. I I've got to ask your view on the... The, the fact that America is still in Iraq. How do you view what got us into Iraq, or what got the U.S. into Iraq in the first place, and how it's been uh, maintained? Well, th we got into Iraq really for oil. Uh, it was part of the neocon plan much before Bush was elected. Uh, it, it, it's part of a, a desire to get control of world oil and back up this economic uh, hegemon uh, with the uh, hegemon military power. Uh, and this is empire at its worst. And of course we stubbed our toe in Iraq and it hasn't come to pass. But you can see the other seeds of it, which most Americans don't know, with the Silk Road strategy that passed to Congress in 1999, where we have declared that from China to uh, Europe, the entire under area across the Eurasian continent, we declare that as our vital national interest. This is like moving the Monroe Doctrine from the Western Hemisphere to the southern part of the Eurasian continent. I mean, this is arrogance beyond compare. And of course, Iran is on, is on, the, on the cards to some. Uh, what do you view in terms of the prospect of America stretching itself that far? Or something? Ridiculous. I think that uh, uh, if, we, if a foreign policy that would make sense, we should, we should want to be friendly with Iran. Iran is the key to solving the problems in the Middle East. It's the key to Eurasian problems. It's, it's, it's the key to a whole host. And they wanted to be party. After 9-11, they helped us in, in Afghanistan. They, they offered us all kinds of assistance and all we did is thumb our nose at them. And of course, we're the ones that incited Saddam Hussein to invade them over, uh, over the problems we had at the embassy. But then again, most people forgot that we're the ones that trashed their democracy in 53 when we had Mossadegh that we, along with the British, I might say, threw out of power. We ruined their country and they've forgiven us to some degree. But it, it's just a terrible, Iran is very key. The, key. the key nations in the world we should have a very close relationship with, in my mind, are Russia, China, Japan, Iran, Brazil, and maybe you could pick a few others. But, th but that's where, where our foreign policy should pivot around and, and we could do it in peace and cut our military budget by 60% and have a good, strong defense. But that's not where we go. Well, let's get Paris on the line. John is with us. Uh, good to have you, John. What's uh, your question, please? Hello, yes. First of all, I just wanted to say to Mike that I would have voted for you. I vote by absentee ballot in New York State, but I don't believe your name was on the ballot. I would have. No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. <laughs> I'm sorry. And thank anyway, you for your have, thought, though. I would have, but I liked your candidacy a lot. I'm, I've just picked up a book recently. I haven't read it yet. I was wondering if you know of it. It's called Imperial Hubris, and the subtitle is Why the West is Losing the War on Terror. It's by Michael Scheuer. Or Scheuer. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Have you heard of that sorry, book? Yeah. And no, I, I haven't. I recommended it about, in terms of... Uh, about the kind of themes that you bring up about, yeah. well, the title is again Imperial Hubris, and it's like, you know, the United, United I've been States. Been on the show with this, yeah. yeah. No, I haven't heard about it, but I can tell you it's, it's sort of a universal theme that intelligent people can buy into, and it doesn't surprise me that somebody's written a book about it. Uh, if you just look uh, uh, here, uh, name escapes me, but if you just look at the empires, the Roman Empire, the Spanish Empire, the Dutch Empire, the British Empire, they've all been conquered by hubris. Uh, and the, the Spanish Empire is the one that's closest to us where they concentrated and they had all kinds of wealth. They concentrated on their military prowess and forgot everything else. And boy, they could make the best swords in the world. And that's all they had left after the Armada was wiped out and they went the way of it. And so we were, go we're, we're exactly going that way right now. We have this phony, phony bravado, this jingoistic patriotism. I wanna tell you, 
I consider myself a patriot, and that's the reason why I'm so critical of our foreign policy and the leadership of our country. Let me put an email to you, sir. This came from France. And a regular viewer, Bruno, uh, wrote in, Bruno Drusky, you wrote in from Paris, and um, good to hear from him on this. It said, how do you explain that there are no clear differences in the programs of Republican or Democrat candidates concerning Palestine, Iraq, Afghanistan, and Iran? Don't you think that this is proof that the corporate media, big business, and the Israel lobby are controlling the campaigns? In this situation, do you think voting makes any sense? Well, you're quite right. And does mo voting make any sense? Uh, I here, I don't think so, not in the subject area you just talked of. I think it makes sense in the terms of the kind of people that you will see within the bowels of the government. Because I think under Bush we had so many crazies running around uh, the halls of, of the government. So with Obama, you'll get a better quality of people, but you won't get a better direction of the country. That's the sadness that I see. But uh, he's quite right. What, uh, wh what future do we have with the continued American imperialism? And you're, you're an advocate for people uh, having a referendum when they vote well, so that they can actually make laws themselves. Yeah? Here, I've, I've come to the conclusion after much thought and much deliberation that there is no way to bring about change within representative democracy. It has to come from, there's only two venues. One is the government wherein the problem lies. The other is with the people. And so let me quote Cicero. You'll love this, Riz. Cicero defined freedom as participation in power. In a democracy, power is exercised by lawmaking. So we Americans think we're free, but we're not free because we don't make laws at the federal level. If we want to be free, we have to be able to make laws like those in representative government. And so I've written legislation called the National Initiative for Democracy. If the, pe the Congress will never enact it, but the people can vote for it, bring it into being, and then we'll have freedom. We have an, an email that came in from Australia, SNOMA from Sydney wrote in saying, do you think that the UN should send international observers to ensure that US citizens have fair elections and the opportunity to elect the president they voted for? Of course we should have the UN. We've not had a fair election in this country in I don't know how long. They stole it in 2000. They stole it in Ohio in 2004. There's been scandals with our, our uh, voting machines ad nauseum. Here, I think Jimmy Carter, with his uh, in his uh, uh, area where he monitors elections, I think he once said that I don't think that we would pass muster in uh, with his criteria of monitoring elections. This is here, Jack Kennedy. Jack Kennedy, that everybody thinks is so great, my God, he couldn't have got elected had not the mayor of Mayor Daley of Chicago delivered the votes when they knew knew how many they needed to get. And Lyndon Johnson would never have become a senator uh, if it not been for the votes that were stolen in Texas. Our whole history is replete with this kind of stuff. And so, and we hold ourselves as the, the purest and the best democracy in the world, please. Please, don't believe everything you hear. Do you have any optimism that things will change in America then? Because it seems to be a downhill slide economically, politically. Everyone seems to be out to, to point out now the things that have gone wrong. Do you see any light at the end of the tunnel? I do. I do. I'm an optimist. I think that the United States, the people, have a sense of fair play. I think that Americans are very creative. You know why we're so creative? Because we're the amalgam of the populations of the world. We've been blessed with unusual geography and resources. And so there is still hope. If we can shuck the leadership that we have, our leadership for the last 50 years has been very, very poor. I can single primarily Dwight Eisenhower, who predicted our demise because of the possible control of the military industrial complex. Well, his predictions have come to pass and we're suffering the consequences thereof. If we can get the American people empowered to make laws, they'll act better than their leaders. 30 seconds to go, sir. What's next for you? I will continue to lecture and write, and uh, I hope to have my own television show, which I call Global Perspectives, which will deal with the military-industrial complex head-on. You're going to take on the... <laughs> the what, what? Head, head on. Okay. One thing, I'm a maverick. And as I pointed out with Sarah Palin, she has courage. I have no fear. I wish you luck, sir. Thank you very much for being with us, sir. Thank you for having me. And thank you for being with us. Don't forget, you can find out what's coming up next on the Internet, and you can join us for that. We'll see you next time. For me and the team, goodbye.